Yeah, okay, welcome to my talk on unit testing and TDD. Um, testing is an important subject, and there should always be on every conference lots of talks about it in, in, for, for all programming languages. On the ha other hand, there have been already a lot of talks in a lot of conferences, and, and I don't know if I can say something truly original about this. So this talk is aimed mostly at, at beginners in testing, but also for people that have tried testing a lot and somehow struggle with it, found it difficult to adopt, are simply dissatisfied with, with, um, with the success that they have with it. Um, the general structure is the why, the when, not, and the how. Note it's a bit different than in the title. It just sounded better in the title. And uh, let's, let's start with basic reasoning why we would do testing at all. And um, the thing is, what do we do as coders? We, we read a lot of code, and we read a lot of code, and we just continue reading. And only after reading a lot, we will also write some code. And usually the point at this time in any presentation is the code should be readable because we read it much more than we write it. But I want to add a third thing that we always do, and that is the trying out afterwards. See, see run the code and see if it actually works. And um, I, I hardly ever commit any code without at least trying out, without looking at it at all, because when I do, I always manage, even, even in a single character change, I always manage to put in some, some uh, new error. So at least I, I, I try to compile it, I run it. In, in some form, it, it has to be done. And, and when these, this phase of baby steps, uh, baby sicknesses is over, and you, you know your code runs, then you feel, this, feel like Dr. Frankenstein. It's alive, and you'll be really happy about that. And a very important thing is um, you can be your own beta tester. You, you, you simply get a feel of how the code works. And uh, unfortunately, uh, all, all future techniques that I will build on now, everything like automating tests and TDD, will not give you this. But I'll come back to that later. Uh, one of the dangers of maybe uh, trying out is shotgun programming. As, as humans, we tend to try to keep the, the thinking as, uh, at a minimum. And I, I catch myself frequently that in, instead of really thinking how to solve the problem, I just try it out. Oh, it doesn't run. Then I wiggle some variables, try it out again, and I just continue this without actual thinking until, until it looks good enough. Um, the, the other extreme is maybe a little bit older. The, at the time of uh, punch cards, and maybe nowadays if, if you have a slot at a, at, a, at a time slot at a supercomputer, I'm sure you will think for hours over your code to make sure that the one shot that you have at running the code will be, the, will be successful. But what is the right thing to do? Should it be a lot of thinking and hardly ever trying out, or should it be a lot of trying out and hardly ever thinking? Um, let's get back on track on the why. Let's automate. And, and trying out is nothing really else than, than automated trying out. And computers are very good at doing uh, repetitive tasks. And um, especially when the setup uh, is expensive. I, I imagine there, for example, you, you have to go manually into the, the Django admin or into an SQL console and tweak some records and remove all the traces from the last ten test run. Then you go to your actual application, click, click an, a number of buttons to, to do the, the manual testing, to do the manual trying out. And I bet with so many steps in between, you occasionally will just make some errors and you have to start again, go back to the SQL console, remove all the traces, return to that state. And um, automating it, scripting this part is definitely worth it. And the problem with documentation is that it outdates. And tests, good test names, are very good documentation which automatically raises an alarm as soon as it outdates. So when the, the code changes in some form, 
the test will break and maybe you decide, well, this test is actually outdated. I'll change it or I'll remove it. Okay, now this is a bold statement to say that code becomes reusable and modular. People say that, but, but how, how, how does that happen? Oh, this is a bit too big now. Well, I hope you can still see it. Um, this, this, co this code snippet, it, it, it does what it's supposed to do. So it normalizes the input key and then checks if that key is in some cache storage. Otherwise, it will return a default value. So we are done, right? I mean, the, the code works. It does what it's supposed to do. But, um, but it's really hard to test. Why is it hard to test? Because it uses a lot of outside dependencies. And um, one thing that you usually do is you, you make dependencies injectable. In this case, you would move the, uh, the, the store from the functional scope that we have here, one scope further up into the object scope, and then the test can easily inject those dependencies, uh, and the function accesses it through the, the option, uh, to, the, to the object scope. Uh, another thing that you realize when doing tests is um, the, the, um, the, the standard dictionary has a get, uh, the, the get of the standard dictionary accepts an optional parameter for the default. And that's a good pattern. And in this case, it also helps with testing because you can simply put it as an additional parameter into the function call instead of having to mock the get default um, function in the object. And then, while testing, you might also realize that this um, normalizing of the function is really its own, uh, the normalizing of the key is actually its own functionality, and you might want to extract it so that you can build targeted tests for this one and targeted tests for the, the getting out of the storage. So what testing really does is it testing reuses your code, and, uh, and by trying to have small test cases, you are reusing it bit by bit and in order to make your code testable, you have to make it reusable and you have to make it modular. So, testable code is good code. Let's get back and see um, what, what happens if we don't just write a few tests, just, just maybe the happy cases and maybe one thing, but really a comprehensive test suite, which means that you try to go through all the error cases, you try to obtain as much uh, code coverage as possible. Um, well, as I just said, if, if you care for all, all uh, error cases and for all branches, then your code becomes more robust because, if, because it's not a thing that you normally try out. You, you, some, some things are even Im impossible to try out through the UI, but they still somehow happen due to mysterious circumstances. And in automated tests, you can, uh, you, you can produce these weird circumstances and that way test all cases, which makes it more robust. And once it's more robust, you have protection against regression. And only comprehensive test suites give you that. Just a few tests here and there are no, no protection against regression at all. And um, regression is maybe a thing when you change a small function somewhere, if you, if you work on a single ticket. But my favorite thing is that I'm very dissatisfied with one module. I go into that module and turn it completely upside down. I refactor the whole thing. And when I have, if I have these comprehensive test suites, then I can be sure that my changes, then I can check afterwards what effect do those changes have on the other parts of the, uh, of the system. And, and I have to say this feeling of freedom, that is the best feeling that I ever get during my development, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just happy when I see that. So, okay, you say, I write tests, but afterwards. So, why even bother with TDD? What's, what's the, the point in, in moving the, the testing in front of the development? Uh, well, there are some risks in testing, and um, what I have written so far, what I have said so far, you can find it in any book, but the books, maybe don't mention all too often also the, the risks, and especially because accomplished testers don't really have these problems anymore. An accomplished tester might say, 
what kind of moron says that he's going to make tests, but then is not doing them? In my experience, it, is, it just practically happens that out of all kind of reasons, not being clear about it, sometimes just being lazy, you're not doing it. Um, we can assume maybe, people have talked about it often enough, that, that writing good tests um, uh, is, is profitable because, because you gain more time then you lose writing the tests. Unfortunately, you will not only write good tests, you will also write bad tests, and that also takes time, which, which you don't get back. And in fact, once you have those bad tests, um, you, you will pay interest. You pay interest to update them, or you pay interest to, to live with them. And what I just said, that tests make refactoring possible, they also discourage refactoring. I once had, uh, uh, I had, extensive tests on my views, like 120 test cases on the views. And um, the test relied on a certain way that the views set up their the initial data. But that, that way, how they set up, that was just deprecated, and I wanted to change it. So I wanted to refactor it so that the views get their set up data from someplace else, but that would break all the tests. So it took quite some time I, I postponed it a lot because I was simply afraid of breaking all the tests and having to rewrite all this stuff again. And with all things, if you simply don't do it right, then you don't get the benefit out of it. I said the benefit of good test names is that they document. If the, the test names are not good, then they don't document. And this has something to do, uh, sorry, this has something to do with, uh, with the robustness of the methodology. Uh, testing itself doesn't seem to be robust because the worse you do it, the less benefit you get. A, a robust system would be, well, you do it halfway correct and you still get good benefits, but um, that, that's not the case. Um, I've been talking about shotgun uh, programming. Shotgun debugging is, is the, the scaled up version of it that you don't really have to understand the code at all. There's a bug somewhere or you, you have to add a new feature Test, test break. Well, you just wiggle variables so long and you run the test and wiggle variables and run the test until it works. No thinking involved. Um, so, yeah, as I said, this is a question of, about robustness. And um, moving now the testing from after the development, before the development, it, it doesn't solve those problems. But I have found out that it gives us a certain amount of control over them. So laziness and time pressure leading to not writing tests. Actually, TDD doesn't help so much with that. Um, you, can, you can just as easily not write tests beforehand as you can not write tests afterwards. But then again, um, postponing the testing until a time when the developer has somehow found closure, when the developer thinks now the thing is done, that maybe is just not the optimal time to, to put their testing in the process. So maybe TDD helps us a little bit. I show that by some arbitrary number. This is really absolutely arbitrary number. It just says, well, maybe it, it helps us a little bit. It gives us a little bit of control. Um, bad tests. Um, whenever, whenever you do two related things, then you do the first, the, the one that you do first, you do it twice. So when we do test after, then we do the code. And while, while doing the test, we go back to the code and update it a little bit. And, and there we have actually the thing that, that tests help improve the code quality. On the other hand, if we do the test first and, and the coding after, then we are working through the tests twice. Once when we write it and once when we are actually doing the code. Sometimes maybe we realize, oh, the test was a bit wrong and we have to update it. So which one is better? And um, I think that um, we have to, to see the priority. The, the most important thing about code is that it runs correctly. The second priority of code is that it is of good quality. This is maybe weird for developers, but uh, in, in, an economy, uh, in the economy, it is in fact so that if you have running code, independent of the quality, 
maybe that is the time when you start making money and that is necessary for anything to continue. And also, um, we have processes, we have refactoring and the tests help us a lot to later update uh, the code quality to become better. We have the tests to help us in the refactoring. On the other hand, it is not priority one of tests that they just pass. It, it's not the objective that we have many tests that pass. The objective is that the tests are of good quality, that they are testing exactly what we want to do. So I say the most important thing at the time of creation is that we are thinking about tests twice. So we do it first and then we think about it again to ensure good quality because unfortunately there isn't really this, this third instance, the other thing which helps us refactoring the tests. We are a bit on our own on that one. So, back. Um, I, I would say that gives us quite, a TDD gives us quite a lot of improvement on this one. And um, for, for the refactoring, TDD actually literally is the answer because what you don't want to do, what you don't want to do is um, um, what I do in the, in the test after mentality, what you do is that you, you first go into the code, you, you refactor the code because it's bad code, and then you break all the tests. Ah, well, okay, and then you go into the test and then you change all the tests. But not only is this dreadful work, but also you're losing all the benefits. The tests don't help you anymore. They don't protect your refactoring. So literally the, the solution to this one is think the other way around, think test first. Go into the test first, refactor the test first to, to be able to do both uh, the new and the refactored version of the code and then afterwards refactor the code. And that way you are protected all the way through. So even more imaginary point on this one. And with test names, it, it's the same thing really because um, when you are testing first, then the very first line of code that you're writing is the test name. So the very first thing that you do is, when you start, articulate what you are going to do next. And that's how you get good test names. On the other hand, if you have the test after mentality, if all your code is already there and you just copy paste a lot of test cases, then you just, you just have to fill a void with necessary identifiers. The compiler says, well, those tests need some name, and you just say then test one, test two, test three, test four, test again, uh, and so on. Um, so I would say TDD gives us even more control on that one. Uh, but there are still two, case, two points that I skipped so far. And, um, well, they are really difficult. You need, um, you need understanding. You need to understand your, um, the, the requirements in order to do this well. As I said about shotgun debugging, shotgun debugging is the opposite of understanding. It is the not thinking. So TDD helps us with, um, with thinking because it, um, it focuses on the what and not on the how. Um, in fact, I would say um, when, when, when you are at this place that you want to write a good test as the first thing, you can't really do that without, um, without understanding what this is about because you have to formulate a test name and you have to, to, to create, you have to create the what, you have to articulate it not only in the name but also in the, in the, in the test code. And at this time your understanding becomes deeper. On the other hand, unfortunately it is possible to just put there some code which which seems to be like maybe what the customer wants. And it, it is always very easily possible to just put some tests afterwards which pass. Writing tests that pass is, is very easy, but that's not what we want. So the control that TDD gives us here by, well, as, as in Germany we, we would say understanding helps you to overcome your inner pig dog. But let's have a small intermission. Why is testing especially good for Pythons? Uh, in some LinkedIn post, unfortunately, I, I didn't write down the source, so I can't give you the source. 
but in some LinkedIn post I saw like nine or 12, um, a matrix of nine or 12 of the, these kind of diagrams which plot efficiency that you, ga that you have in a language uh, as a function of the experience that you have in the language. And I distinctly remember that there was a significant update in uh, a spike in efficiency due to unit tests. And I was wondering, and I, I mean, it's true, I, I felt this myself, but, but why is that so for Python and not for all the other programming languages? In my opinion, one of the reasons is Python has problems. And that's absolutely fine, nothing is problem free, but we, we need to have solutions for those problems. And one of the problems that is very often mentioned with Python is the dynamic typing. Uh, especially Java and Haskell programmers might not even try Python because they say, uh, dynamic typing, that can't really work well. My compiler checks against that. Um, does everybody know what dynamic typing means? Or let's ask, who, who knows what dynamic typing means? Uh, I think that's almost everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit short on time, so I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll continue on. Uh, so what, what is it that, pr that Python programmers say afterwards? They say, ah, it's not really that bad. So, so who is right? Are the Python programmers just biased to see their own faults, or are the, the statically typed proponents just not seeing the light? Well, in my opinion, uh, unit tests help alleviate the problem a lot, because um, comprehensive unit test suites will help you um, help you go through all, all branches of your code, and that's why they will execute all type errors, they will execute all non-type non exceptions, and they will fail on it. Uh, I have realized that myself, that I, I am actually suffering from the dynamic typing. I am producing a lot of these type errors in my code. It's just that during the trying out and during the testing, I find them very quickly, and, and they are not a problem for me anymore. So, okay, the Haskell compiler and the Java compiler, they, they solve the problem systematically. But unit tests, they do it, they do it well enough for Python. Um, another thing is the Haskell compiler does it for free. Unit tests are not free because you have to write them. But then again, you anyway want to write unit tests, so they are a free side effect. Another reason is are the great frameworks. And, um, at the moment, that's especially Nose and PyTest. Um, there, there are lots of talks about PyTest, especially also here in Bilbao. So I'm not going very deep into this, but there's one thing that I want to mention as, as the difference between JUnit and PyTest, which I don't hear so very often. So JUnit is object-oriented, which means that we have a base class with all, with, with all kind of generic assertions. And then we have lots and lots of uh, test cases, which have a setup and a teardown, very special assertions, some helpers, and then maybe lots of test cases. So we, in object-oriented programming, we try to encapsulate many things into one class. Things that belong together, they go together into one namespace. The thing is that we, for tests, it doesn't really seem to work because we have, on the one hand, the functionality, and on the other hand, we have the state in which the thing is. So, for example, if we have some, some list implementation or some stack implementation, we have different functionalities like getting the length, appending something, popping something, and we want to have test cases for the setup when the, the stack is empty, when it's at ca capacity or filled. So how do you organize these in an object? Either you, you organize them by functionality, then you can't use the setup. Uh, then you can't use the setup provided by the test framework. Each, each test function has to do its own setup. Or you, you organize them by state, which means that you, you have to put widely different functionality into one object. And, and where, where do the helpers go? The, the helpers must be somehow mixed in from the outside. And mix-ins work if you have a, a multiple inheritance and if your language allows mix-ins. I was working in a project, with, this is not from the project, but in that project we had to write a diagram in order to find out um, how much, uh, uh, how to write the next test. Okay, I have to speed up a lot. PyTest is the answer. There is, um, 
they are, they are, it has a more function-based approach instead of the object-based approach, and that helps a lot. Okay, the when not. Um, I'm sure that if you had some frustrating time with tests, you would like to have a, a certificate like this. I, I, you want me to give you now a, a direct reason, which hopefully um, is exactly your reason, and from now on you don't have to do any tests, you don't have to put any work there. But it's not that easy. The general, uh, general thing is that if, if it doesn't work for you, improve it until it works. But what I don't like about this is um, that it doesn't mention the costs. Uh, and it's an economic factor. We have to see, um, we have to measure how uh, the, the, the costs against the profit. And maybe the profit is really high, and maybe the costs are low, but the costs are something that we have to be aware of and that we, we have to mitigate. We have to first find out where are our costs, first reduce them, and only then we should try to improve. Uh, where do the costs come from? They come from mismatches between TDD and other things. The first mismatch might be you. Uh, it's not common school practice to throw little children into the deep water because that's the way how they learn to swim fastest. Unfortunately, in corporate culture, that is the case. So you are a developer, you start with TDD right now. And I think that's the, the reason why um, managers don't think that testing is a good thing, why, why they don't get that feeling. Because it's simply not, you can't just turn it on and it starts laying golden eggs. Uh, well, the, the, luckily we have, uh, we have a good argumentation here. We agree that, that having good tests is what we want. And we have to write tests to have the good tests. But writing them also gives us bad tests. And now the, the good thing is that the more we write, the more we learn to write better tests. But now the problem with this is that learning is a human experience. And you, you can't infinitely learn. You cannot learn too many things at once, and you do not learn at all if the problem is too difficult. And now we have a new concept, the difficulty of testing. I don't know of any metric, but um, I'll give you some examples of things that are very difficult to test. So framework subclasses like Django generic views, maybe, you know, where, where, where the class really is a combination of class, class um, variables and mix-ins. Those are really difficult to unit test. Anything asynchronous is very difficult. Uh, simulated environments like a mobile platform, where, where, where the platform on which you are developing is evolving and, and you have to mock a lot. Abstract subclasses uh, evolve, in, in my case, quite often before I really know what they are supposed to do. They become useful already. I generalize without really having a good name for that thing that I'm producing there, and that makes them really hard to test. And everything that has high interaction means a lot of mocking, and a lot of mocking always need, means a lot of uh, um, complexity. Another thing is that um, if you read a TDD book, you, you, you get the impression that TDD is all that you ever need. You just, you, you just turn this one on, and then everything works fine. But what is not said there is that you need to, to have a process around it which fits with that. So um, you need a specification gathering process, which is maybe in your company done by non-technical people. And uh, especially, you need an architecture around it. And the architecture also needs to fit with TDD. Because if you do TDD alone, ignoring the architecture, you will always build something which breaks apart at iteration three. Um, the team has to be on your side because doing it alone just doesn't work. Um, if you have a customer that you can educate in your process, great. But if you have an ever-changing customer, it's just simply not worth it. So, so you have to, to compromise between what the customer gives to you. Maybe the customer gives you only very vague things, which simply doesn't work with TDD at all because TDD requires you to have very good specifications at the beginning. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that um, having good specifications at the beginning is a bad thing. Definitely not. You, you want to have that. But, um, but if you don't have to, you might have to compromise. Um, then there are spikes. I'm, I'm sometimes going off to little programming adventures, and, I'm, and those co that code might become really big. But it's, I'm, I'm, I'm starting really on an adventure without a plan, not knowing where, and then TDD is simply impossible. So in the end, I would say it's, um, everything is in a relation. You have to see, is your competence good enough to, to tackle the difficulty? 
and can you alleviate the uncertainty? If, if not, if, if you encounter something which is simply too difficult for you to test, then don't, don't try to bite it until your teeth fall out. Maybe skip the tests on that one and, and test something else first until your competence grows enough, because it, it will always grow. No, nobody ever finishes. Nobody has this competence where he can test everything. But you can also see that um, there, are, there are three people on one side, and the process is for hire. So if you can get the process on your side, there are four, four people on your side, and that should, should give you the bias that a lot of testing is a good idea. Okay, but how, how to do it now? Um, we agree on the why, and uh, we know that there are some costs, but uh, how, how, to, how to go to the next step, how, how to work with those costs? One thing, I, um, this is mostly a recap actually, because I have mentioned already the tools, and uh, it's very important not only that you use the right tools, but that you learn them beforehand. Don't, don't start learning a completely new testing tool and a new testing methodology in, in the new project that you are building, uh, which, which will involve, may involve maybe 30 developers. What you want is you, um, you, you build maybe a small experimental project on yourself, for yourself, maybe a tic-tac-toe game. And in that game, you, you try out everything so you will learn all the dependencies and all the configuration of the testing tools. Don't try to learn too many things at, at once. Uh, continuous integration helps you uh, and, and your team with, with peer pressure because it shows you uh, everything uh, it shows you whenever somebody breaks the tests. The tests don't help at all if you don't run them, if you just write them and you don't run them regularly. Continuous integration will not only run them, but will inform the whole team by email, for example, uh, if somebody breaks it. And uh, you have to create a company culture uh, in, in which nobody wants to be the one who broke the tests. And with peer pressure, you can, it, it becomes fun um, doing it the right way. I also have realized, just, just do it. Just, just start with the first test. If you have legacy code and you test after, that's fine too. Just start with the first test. And while you're doing the test, you will realize, oh, by the way, there's this one error case. It's very easy. I just copy paste this test and change a little bit here and there, and then you have the second test. And, and then you realize, hey, well, it's, it's just a few steps and I can have really thorough tests. And I will ha you'll have a comprehensive test suit in no time. And never stop the trying out. I have mentioned at the beginning, trying out is, is a thing which gives, you, which gives you a feeling of the code. How, how usable is it? How, how performant is it? Does it make really any sense? I have just heard somebody tell me that he, he has written these great tests and everything was working with tests. But then when after a long time they actually started the application, they realized that half of the buttons were invisible because they did have tests on, on that part. Um, I have mentioned these things which are very difficult to test, especially with unit tests like um, interaction and asynchronous, uh, asynchronous co um, co connection to, to third parties. And the, 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 the point here is that functionality tests or integration or acceptance tests, whatever the name for that should be, uh, will help you a lot. And that gives you behavior-driven development as the, the next step above. There are, the, the names are sometimes used differently, but also I have seen in this conference already talks which show you, you have the TDD process as the small one using small unit tests, and then you have the behavior-driven development cycle around that, which cares for the bigger tests, for the acceptance tests. So. There are cases in which I don't do any unit tests at all because the functional tests will catch it. A unit, um, that is also a thing right here. What is a unit? Um, I was very confused about this a lot because this name also implies somehow that everything is made up of units. So everything can be unit tested. And I disagree with that. There are some things which are simply not meant to be unit tested. You have to have tests on everything so that you know that the code runs through but sometimes functionality or integration tests are simply enough for it. Uh, if you want to, to create your, your, test, um, your test names, then think, uh, think uh, user story. As a, a storage module, I want to access the file system by doing this and that. And out of that user story, you can generate the, the, the test name. 
And as I have now mentioned a few times, don't be dissatisfied with your progress. Sometimes you see people that say, oh yeah, I'm doing, I have 100% coverage, I have 3,000 uh, lines of code for tests, uh, lines of test, and only 40 lines of code, and you get the feeling, oh, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not satisfied with my testing, maybe I don't benefit because I'm not doing it extreme enough. I don't think that it is, that, that it is like that. So don't overdo, you will grow slowly, and the thing is, don't expect expect testing to be the thing that you turn on and then everything works fine. What do I mean with do it all wrong? I said already you should have this uh, small, you have this small um, testing project. You have a tic-tac-toe game, for example. And now try it. It's, it's only maybe one, one file of code and you write comprehensive test suits, suites um, that, um, that have 100% coverage Coverage is a tool which I didn't have the time to, to mention now. And you will, and then try out afterwards to introduce a bug that is not found by any of your tests. And, and that way you will find out it's actually quite easy to do and that way you realize how to write the tests. You can create a monster test case for all features at once and then you try to refactor and you will find out that test is horrible. Uh, you can, if you test too many implementation details instead of the overall API, your tests are really bad. I have learned all of these things by doing them in huge production projects, and I just wish I would have learned them in, in very small projects. So if this is all that you, that you get from, from my talk, um, try it out beforehand. Don't try to do too much learning at once. Uh, and with that, I, I'm, I reached the end of my presentation. And um, do you have any questions? Thank you, Fabian. I'm very sorry, but we have no, no time for questions because we are running out of time. Oh, Thank okay. you.